That Metal Interview. And we have a brand new episode of That Metal Interview podcast. Thank you guys for subscribing to our YouTube channel. Thank you guys for supporting us on all digital formats. Spotify, Pandora, and so on and so on. You guys know what's up. iHeartRadio, of course. And our website, of course, of jrocksmetalzone.com. 24-7 rock metal in your face and as you guys know we are the only podcast in the world that i'm aware of that covers all rock metal spectrum the whole spectrum that we cover we cover anything from we've interviewed hair metal bands we've interviewed black metal bands we've interviewed thrash metal bands we've interviewed all kinds of bands i mean i'm talking about names like Max Cavalera has been on our show. Uh, Jen Majura of Evanescence has been on our show. Mr. Bill Leverty. And on this episode, we have the great guitar player from the great band, Great White, Mr. Mark Kendall, of course. And uh, back to what I was saying, uh, we've interviewed musicians from Cradle of Filth, musicians from Borknagar. We've interviewed... Tons of people, uh, Scour, Neckrot, and so on and so on and so forth. Morbid Angel, Vinny Apice, LA Guns, all these people have been on our show, Nervosa, and so on and so on. Striper. Anyway, so uh, thank you for supporting us, even though we are that versatile as far as picking and uh, interviewing uh, rock metal artists, you know. Um, some might be of your flavor, of your taste of music. Some might not be, of course. If you're a hard rock fanatic, I'm sure you're not going to be a death metal or black metal fanatic. So you might skip, you're probably skipping our our heavier interviews, you know what I mean? So that's cool, and vice versa. I mean, if you're a Cradle of Filth fan, uh, Max Kevlar, Soulfly fan, Morbid Angel, you're probably skipping our Striper, uh, Firehouse, and so on, Rat. Uh, interviews and all that so it's all good so as uh, we appreciate your support thank you for all of your continued support guys and girls so anyways let's go and check out our interview with the great legend from great white mr mark kendall who was nice enough to make some time to spend time with our podcast uh on this brand new year of 2021 so let's check it out mark kendall congrats on your 18 years of sobriety man it, it's actually 12 but thanks oh. a lot man okay okay <laughs> i missed it <laughs> hey, no worries yeah i got sober in uh, uh 2008 november 1st uh. so so i just uh crossed the 12 year mark <laughs> can, you, can you talk about that a bit it was it kind of difficult because I, I drink i'm a drinker myself uh, yeah well, um, I kind of, I kind of always had this like, I think the seed was planted because my dad kind of struggled uh, with alcohol, so I think, um, you know, I've always been kind of compulsive and always um, kind of had a weird like embedded fear, wow. um, and it started when I started like performing in front of people like small crowds at parties, like when I was like 15. And, you know, there was alcohol around and, you know, we drink beer on the weekends and stuff like that. And it always made it easier to get out in front of people and get cocky and play my guitar. So um, I, I just think it escalated from there over time. And um, to make a long story short, I when I was about, I think, 26 years old or so yeah. i really noticed just from hard partying when i woke up in the morning i was a little shaky you know yeah i felt i felt a little like kind of nervous and you know um so i would just drink a couple beers and it went away and i go okay great yeah. <laughs> i go i'll just use beer to cure everything <laughs> you know and so uh but by the time I was 34, I was, like, getting, like, so much pain and shaking really bad in the morning. And it was becoming, like, an everyday, like, like, I didn't roll out of bed and just grab a bottle of whiskey and just wail on it. But, you know, I was drinking beer, like, all the time. 
And this one time we were about to do a video and I could tell the band, the way they were acting around me, yeah. that, that they were either going to do an intervention or say something to me because they, they knew I was, you know, uh, struggling. And so before they could say anything, we were going to have this meeting. I go, hey, you know, I've never been sober. I've never tried. I don't even know how to go about it, you know. You know, so it's not like I'm, you know, refusing help here, you know. So I went to a rehab in Arizona, uh -huh. kind of listened to these people and, they, you know, telling me this and that is progressive and, and whatever. So I was there for 30 days. And when I got out, we had um, this release party for an album uh, called Hooked. And we had a big party with about 2,000 people in the Capitol parking lot. We had jugglers and, you know, it was just this big, outrageous party. Wow. So I'm coming straight out of this rehab place, you know. I've been, like, in confinement for 30 days. So I go up and I start jamming with Vivian Campbell, and I'm scared to death. I mean, I'm stone cold sober, and I'm just not comfortable <laughs> at all, you know. And... uh so eventually, after about, I think, 10 months, you know, I started dabbling in, you know, drinking again. But I was trying to drink normal. I was trying to just drink like the guy watching the game on the weekends, you know, just having a couple of beers with his friends. Yeah. So I would try my damnedest not to drink the next day. And I, I'd go on like that for a couple of weeks, but pretty soon I was drinking again, you know. So then I started quitting for like two years you know eliminating every just alcohol only it really didn't change my behavior you know anything like that and yeah. um so i was always jealous of the normal drinker really? so i can't i kept going back and trying again i go this time i'm gonna drink just like a normal joe you know yeah and i i again i would do good for a little while but right back to the pain and all this shit. <laughs> so I went on that, I went on on like that for years, but I literally could quit and just kind of white knuckle it for a year and a half, two years, you know? And then um, in 2008, it was like for the first time ever, I was actually honest with my wife. I called her on the phone. I was in Utah, we were playing a show and I told her I drank, but I go, before you get all upset and freak out, here's the good news. When I get home, I'm going to get into a program. I'm going to listen to these long-term sobriety dudes, do everything they say, take direction, you know, yeah. really. Because all this time in these years that I kept going in and out, I, well, in like programs, they call it having one foot in the door and one out, yeah. you know. And uh, that's how I kind of was, you know. I would show up and everything, but my my heart wasn't into it, you know. Yeah. And uh, so finally, you know, I surrendered and and uh, you know really uh, really went for it. And I, I worked with a guy, you know, and he told me, you know, after about three months, I'm really going to notice my life is changing. Well, three months rolls by, and I go, hey, dude, you know, I, I believe you in everything, but I'm just not seeing anything good coming my way, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, but sure enough, within about three or four weeks after that, man, things started going good for me, um, you know, financially, my relationship, my, my kids were all trusting and loving and just all that shit just took care of itself, you know, because oh. in the past, I, I kept getting sober for other people because uh, mama don't like me drunk, you know, so, OK, I'll quit. Yeah. And then as soon as, she, as soon as she was happy, I would drink again. You know <laughs> what I mean? I got all the trust from everybody. Now it's time to get a 12 pack, you know. <laughs> so I. I uh, but once I got sober for myself and really you know, really went after it because it was doing me no good. Uh, you know, it was a really dark world. I felt a lot of shame, pain, guilt, uh, you know, all that, you know, because I was abusive. 
Yeah. You know, I got I got all kinds of friends that drink. You know, they're like regular Joes. You know, they're responsible. They got great families. They work every day. You know, and they they like to have some beers when they watch the game and stuff like. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I I just I, I'm more compulsive alcoholism Joe. You know, so I had to give in and and you know just say okay. You know, screw all you guys. Yeah. I can't do it. You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> but uh, I've done real well, though. That's great. That's a great story right there. Uh, there's a similar uh, artist uh, story, I guess. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Dave Mustaine. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I know Dave real well. Oh, he yeah? went to high school with my little brother. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. Small world. Well, uh, you, well, you know the story. I read. Uh, he was a. Uh, I guess uh, he liked to fight. And he got drunk. So yeah. that's a similar uh, story, huh? Uh, kind of. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, some people, uh, when they the alcohol, um, there's some kind of chemical thing in them that makes them violent, you know. Oh. And and uh, I I spoke with somebody that was in a Cherokee tribe um, that actually worked for a casino, okay. and she was uh she worked in a jail, and I said because one time we played for a lot of uh, Indians at like uh one of these Indian casinos. Okay. And I go, man, there was so many fights. So the, you know, I couldn't believe how violent it got, you know? <laughs> and she told me that there's something chemically in, wow. you know, uh, Navajo type, yeah. uh, something in their blood that, to where they react um, kind of violent when they drink. Wow. What and it's you? some kind of weird thing. But the, you know, it, it you don't have to be Indian for that to happen. But yeah, because if you look at like a lot of the des domestic violence cases, the alcohol is almost always involved. Right. You know, wow. so uh, you know people lose control, and you know, but yeah. some people like me, I just got all happy and you know, yeah. <laughs> funny, you know, telling jokes, and you know, so I, I wasn't like a guy that just beat everybody up when I got drunk. That's good. Um, I was yeah, I was more chill. I was just you know throwing down a lot of pain on myself because <laughs> when that stuff wore off, man, I was hating life. Uh, Everything was cruising when I was you know drinking, but yeah, it's the the hangover. Yep. Um, yeah, hangover is brutal. Before we get into Great White, I want to mention uh, I want to talk about your solo record, Two Point Zero, yeah. came out about uh, uh, about oh five. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome material. I heard it. Badass. Uh, can you talk about that album? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what happened was in, in about, I think, 2001, toward the end, uh, we did kind of a final show. Everybody wanted to go off and do their own thing. The singer went off and did a solo album. And so we all kind of wanted to just part ways and, and go, go off and do our own thing. So... So I got a group of guys together and ran into a. I, I got the keyboard player for uh, Eric Clapton, a guy, guy called Dickie Sims. Okay. And, uh, you know, he played in the era of Shot the Sheriff and Cocaine, you know, the, oh. that era of Eric. Oh, wow. Well. And, then, and then I got uh, this singer, songwriter dude. But I, originally I was going to sing because in a solo album, you really want to sing. But this guy was such a good singer that I go, damn, I want to make a solo album, but I better just make a, call this a band. Yeah. So I, na I named it Train Station. Okay. And we went in the studio, got this drummer from Arkansas who's really badass. Um, uh, Dickie Sims actually told me about him and said he would be perfect for your style. So, and he was. So we went in and made, made an album kind of shopped it around it was you know uh, i don't know nobody was interested but it's a real good record oh yeah and, and uh so anyways then a year year and a half or so rolled by and i go you know if i'm gonna make a solo album i gotta sing you know i know it's gonna be a pain in the ass but i, I you know <laughs> i gotta do it and i've sang before but just you know, I'm not the type of dude that's just going to go out and be a lead singer. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm thinking. But anyways, I, you know, I got uh, 
this bass player who's just awesome. Um, he used to be the drummer for Tower of Power for like five years. Okay. And and uh, he told me about this drummer that won the Buddy Rich contest like two years in a row. So I go, well, that sounds good enough to me. And he goes, he can really lay down the blues type stuff named Stan Lessingring. So anyways, um, so, uh, so I put that together and I, I found this producer guy <clears throat> that did, um, that produced people like R&B artists, you know, like the Temptations. I mean, he had like, yeah. you know, a, awards and stuff. So I go, that sounds good enough to me. Nice. So yep. he had this like home studio and it was really killer. And his wife was Jane Getz, who was this awesome piano player. I mean, she was like, she played with John Lennon and jammed with Hendrix, supposedly, at oh, one time. Wow. So she was so talented, it would have blown your mind. But anyways, uh, I had her playing a couple tracks, but it was mostly a guitar album. But anyways, uh, so I, you know, I jammed with these guys for a couple of days and just threw songs together really quickly. I just had riffs, had to write lyrics real quick. And we just jammed a couple of days and they, there were such good musicians that they just latched onto the arrangement right away and, you know, just played perfect. So uh, went in, made that record and uh, kind of released it called the 2.0. And I sang for the first time. <laughs> yeah, I have so much respect for singers after I had to do that. It, it, you know, because that that muscle is not something I work a lot. I mean, I, you know, I sing background vocals and whatnot, but you know, yeah. don't even have to warm up. I was like warming up just so I could sing because you got to sing for hours and yeah. you know, like I said, I'm not a true singer, so and good. I have the range of about like Hendrix or maybe Steve Ray Vaughan. I, I'm not, you know. I'm not going to go out and start singing Zeppelin or something, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so, but that was a lot of fun, you know. Um, you know, it could have been better. We can always get better, but, but I, I was, uh, you know, I was happy with the effort for my first time. It sounded good. It sounded badass. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Now, some people don't know uh, you were a baseball player. Can you talk yeah. to us about that experience? Yeah. Um, well. I always loved baseball from the time I was a little kid and I, you know, I collected baseball cards. I had like, you know, I, I don't have the cards. I lost them when we moved, but oh. I had shoe boxes full of like, I'm talking rookie cards. These, these would be like worth so much money today. It just makes me ill. I don't have them. But, um, How did you lose them? So, um, well, we had to move right away. My parents separated only for six months, but they separated. My grandpa came and moved us really quick, and I just forgot him. I left him in my closet. Oh, man. It was two, like, shoe boxes full. I mean, I had, like, Pete Rose Rookie. I had, like, Don Drysdale, Sandy Koufax, all these, like, big-time cards. I mean, oh, back, back then, we're only worth a nickel, but I'm talking today, you know, 50 oh. years later. Oh, yeah. That, that you would get a lot of money, you know, people collect them and stuff. But oh. anyways, uh, regardless of that. So I went into Little League when I was just almost eight years old. My dad took me down and he was my coach my very first year and used to practice with me. You know, he pitched to me, um, kind of tutored me with my hitting and took me, you know, uh, to diamonds and, you know, through threw balls to me so um i played until i was 18 and oh, wow. nice. my dad was my coach or manager every single year so i was pitching in colt league at 18 years old you know where you saw the i didn't throw it 100 miles an hour but yep. there were you know a couple guys that were way up in the 90s you know so i was getting a little discouraged because well, when I was 12 years old, I had a curveball that broke like four feet. I mean, it was like <laughs> this big hook, you know. Yeah. And everybody goes, oh, he, he, he's going to hurt his elbow. You know, he shouldn't be throwing those curves so young. Well, when I was 18, my arm started to hurt, but it wasn't from curveballs. It was from throwing fastballs. Oh, wow. 
and and my arm after three innings it was just blown up i mean from the elbow up it was so sore just after three innings now when i look back on that i think i could have worked out with light weights and and built more strength in my arm but um i, I used you know a lot of times you know the manager will look out and go, oh, he looks like he's getting tired. We better take him out. I used to signal my dad to take me out. <laughs> so go, man, my arm's killing me, man. Put me on first or something, you know. And uh, so I was a little discouraged because um, the guys that were getting scouted, yeah. their numbers would stand above the entire league. I mean, they, like, hit the most home runs. Their numbers were incredible, right? I was like the third best player on my team, oh, nice. <laughs> you know, so the chances of, of them come hunting for me, uh, looking for the third best player on one of the teams was like just zero. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Right. And, and I've been playing guitar since I was nine years old. So the, yep. the baseball was a love, but it was also the music. So I, I played both pretty much equally and, when I was 15 years old, I mean, the guitar never left my hand, practically. So I was already pretty good at 18. Oh, wow. And I just decided just to go, you know, uh, full-time music. And my dad, I think he was a little discouraged at first because he was a jazz musician. And he didn't quite make it, but he was excellent. There was just no money in jazz at that time. So oh, well. he, he pretty much retired at 35 years old so he could take care of us, you know, take care of the family oh, well. and, and work a regular job. So he thought my chances of, you know, stardom or whatever were, you know, he, he said one in a million. And, you know, when I think about him saying that, it reminds me of that movie, uh, Dumb and Dumber, when the guy goes, so you say there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, because it was yeah. zero in a million in baseball. So, <laughs> so, um, but anyways, uh, but he still supported me. Um, and, you know, but, but he just, his vision was for me to be on the LA Dodgers so he could brag to his friends. Yeah. But, um, you know, when I started to get some success with the music, he was really thrilled. And, um, you know, when I gave him his first platinum record, oh, man, it, it was just, it was like a surreal moment. And, wow. you, you know, it, it's just, it, you know, when things like that happen, because, it, you know, you have this, this dream, like when you're a teenager that, you know, just going to concerts, see, you know, seeing Ted Nugent flying through a building or Led Zeppelin, you know. Yeah. It, it's just like to envision myself being on that stage, it was, um, you know, kind of a pipe dream. But I, I kind of, I, I don't know, it was weird. We used to pretend like we were playing the forum and, yeah. you know, <laughs> we used to pretend like we were doing interviews on cassette players. You know, how, so uh, how long the band been together? You know, we're asking like journalist questions to each other. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And so we we're like kids pretending, and and a lot of that pretending became reality. And it, it just, uh, you know, we had belief, but you know, we're we're the type band that started out horrible in a garage, and we just got better from playing together. You know what I mean? Yeah. We had our parents screaming to turn it down and all that stuff. You know, turn that horrible noise down. <laughs> yeah. My mom, my mom used to say to tone it down. Oh, just take a little treble off the amp. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good you one. That's a good one. <laughs> tone it down. That always yeah. cracked me up. You know? tone, yeah. <laughs> Leave the volume alone, but tone it down. <laughs> <Thank you>. uh, <laughs> but anyway, so. Yeah, it, it's uh, that was pretty much my baseball career for me to eighteen. Yeah. I, I love baseball. I still love it today. You know, I sweat the Dodgers, and you know, uh, you know, I'm a big baseball fan. Oh yeah, not just the Dodgers either. I love great players. You know, I love yeah, you know, players that have obscene skills, and you know, so yeah, that's I'm still good. a fan fan of the sport. Well, there you go for the people that don't know. Mark Kendall was a baseball player. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> 
So going back to that yep. uh, that local local band thing, uh, I also play guitar. Uh, uh, -huh. uh So when I started here, it's just a local thing, you know. So uh, here in Texas, uh, same thing. I went through that rehearsal where uh, our backup vocalist was doing some growls, some system of a down growls, and and my uh -huh. dad my dad goes in there and turns off the light. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the power off inside yeah. of the house or something. Just shut the whole thing up. Yeah, anyway, so yeah, I can, That's funny, man. I can relate I to remember it. years ago, this is funny, uh, we used to play a club called The Woodstock. It was in Anaheim, California. Okay. And we were kind of the house band there, you know, all the bands played there and, and even national acts. Oh, yeah. And one night, you uh, two played, right? Okay. And... There was like 11 people there, you know, four of them were playing a pinball machine and the power kept going off. And this big, huge dude, he weighed about 400. He, he was going out in the alley and, you know, redoing the power and then their power would come back on. But uh, one thing I noticed when the power went off is how low their volume was on stage. It was like. But it sounded so good when the PA was on. It was like, it sounded like a CD. I mean, it was just like perfect, you know. Oh, well. And I go, God, these guys might do something someday. One year later, New Year's Day came out. They were huge. It just, I couldn't believe it. Like one year after I saw these guys playing for 11 people, they were massive, you know. Oh, wow. But they, they paid their dues. They came over here and played clubs. Oh, wow. What a story. There you go. Yeah, pretty neat. So uh, speaking of the old days, uh, let's go back in time. Uh, here's a, a mind juggler, uh, uh, Dante Fox. Um, yeah. How did you guys get signed? And uh, can you talk about that era a little bit, a little time? Yeah. Um, well, when I first met Jack Russell, the singer, um, about, you know, we were trying to think of names and we were highway and then we were like wires and high wire and you know, we, we just all these names. Yeah. And then one morning, um, I was painting the backs of AM PM signs. Okay. And I'm like, I think I was maybe 20 years old and, uh, on the way, you know, I've known Jack Russell for four months at this point. So on the way I used to, on the way to this little, factory i used to stop at this liquor store and get something to drink and smokes and stuff like that yeah so i passed by a newsstand and it says jack russell whittier right shoots live in me oh, so wow. he's from he's from whittier but i go it can't be the same guy you know i just saw him like yesterday right so, so i called his mother right there from the liquor store and she said yep he he, we went and did it this time, you know, and I go, are you serious? I go, my singer shoots people, you know, <laughs> so come to find out it was an accident. He was, he was high on drugs or whatever. So he, he was sentenced to eight years in prison. So oh. I'm going like, holy crap. Oh, wow. Well, they cut, they cut it down to four. And then if he joined all the programs they had in this youth authority place they were going to cut it in half again oh wow. so in the meantime i make a whole another band you know and i got a chick singer her okay. name was lisa baker okay and i got a bass player from san diego named don costa and this uh, drummer called uh tony richards okay um, so anyways, we make this band and the bass player comes up with this name, Dante Fox. And I go, okay, that sounds good enough to me. And, uh, so we have the chick singer and then George Lynch, he was in a band called Exciter oh, wow. and he, he stole my singer. <laughs> oh, he did. He st yeah. He took my chick singer. Oh. And here's the funny part. Three years ago, we did a gig with him and Night Ranger. It was a, a corporate gig, like a private party type thing. Okay. And he apologized. <laughs> <laughs> this was like 35 years ago. He's getting apologized. He apologized, you know. It was really <laughs> funny. But anyways, so um, <clears throat> when he took her, we got another singer. His name was uh, Butch, Butch Say. Okay. And he was kind of like a Rob Halford kind of singer. You know, he had this huge range and uh, 
we even played some priest with him in the band because nice. he, he could do exciter like perfect you know so uh we just played around hollywood orange county you know got our name out there and then um all of a sudden i got a call from uh, Jack's dad saying that he's being released into a halfway type house or whatever. Jack, you know okay. they don't they don't just let you out right away. Yeah. And uh, Jack, he said he just wants an audition. Uh, he said he'll blow away anybody you have. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and and I believed it. So, uh, anyways, we auditioned him. Our, our drummer wanted to keep Butch, but. Me and Costa said, "No way! This is this guy is our guy." So, um, so we just went along as this Dante Fox, and uh, within about a year, we were playing at the Whiskey, and there was an A and R man in the crowd, and he gave us his card, and I guess he was out in front of the build and said to come down to the record company the next day, and we said, "Okay." So, um, when he was standing out in front of the club. Uh, well, for one thing, Jack used to call me uh, the Great White when I used to play a solo. Really? But he hadn't said that when this A&R guy was there. So he had no clue about this nickname. Oh, wow. Which it wasn't a nickname like I walked around and people go, hey, Great White, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, it, it was just something he yeah. said when I play a solo. So, um, so it was only from the stage that that would happen. Yeah. But anyways... This a &R man called Alan Niven was out in front of the building waiting for his car. And there was a bunch of kids around him. And he said that I drove by in a car and stuck my head out the window and screamed something to the crowd. And he said the kid next to him pointed at the car and said, there goes Gray White. <laughs> and uh, so when he heard that, something like clicked in his head. So the next day when we had the meeting with him, he said, you know, I really dig the band. You know, I like that encore when you guys played No Doctor by Humble Pie. That was, I could see it could work, you know. Nice. So, so anyways, uh, before we knew it, we were in the studio making an EP with this German producer, uh, Michael Wagner. And who now is an icon. He sold about 100 million records, you know, done Ozzy and just a, a Alice Cooper and a bunch of band, you know bunch of uh, extreme and just tons of bands from our era you know he's in a, a total icon you know famous but anyways at that time he'd only done accept in like a docking demo i think so oh, he didn't know the link he didn't know how to speak english very good and he was just an awesome guy very funny but anyways uh so that's how you got your name so that's yeah. how we got the name and oh. we hated it right away. We just go, great, what? Um, you know, yuck. But then we were driving back. We go, well, at least we have a record deal. I mean, or, or at least sort of one. And, you know, these are just some of the compromises you have to make with the big boys. Yeah. But um, we used to go fishing in Long Beach at, at Jack's boat. And we used to fish for sharks. And he had no gear, you know, it was very non-pro. Uh, he didn't have seats with straps and all, all the safety gear on his boat. You know, we just went out there. And, you yeah. know, I remember I was into this, like, 100-pound hammerhead. And I'm going, dude, you reel for a while. <laughs> <You know? laughs> My arms are in flames, bro. <laughs> and uh, But anyways, that's... We both almost simultaneously go, dude, great white sharks. Hello, you know, <laughs> yeah. like we told, we love the name once we attach the shark to it. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, we just think we're thinking nickname. We, we we for some reason, you know, it it didn't click with us. You know, having a shark image, and then you know, then we uh, we started to like more things about the name, like we can pretty much play whatever we feel like and the name doesn't dictate the kind of music we got to play. You yep. know, it's not a, it's not a name like, you know, the killers or, you know, the, some kind of name that yeah. if you, if, if you play a ballad, you'll get shot, you know, <laughs> it, it's like, you know, like a name like Slayer. I mean, yeah. you, you don't expect them to play once been twice shot, yeah. you know? So, uh, so, so we like that element, you know, that we could be kind of diversified and just 
play our influences and whatnot. Now you were there. So you were there in, in L.A. You guys from L.A. right? You guys uh, did your your first gigs there. Pretty much, yeah. We were uh, all grew up around, uh, you know, within a hundred miles of Los Angeles. Los Angeles, yeah. The suburbs, you know. How were the gigs back then in the eighties? Uh, was there a lot of competition, or, or I heard stories? Oh yeah, in the in the seventies and eighties, it, it was a very healthy music scene. I mean, there were so many great guitar players, and uh, it was just nuts. I mean, I was just in awe. People like Eddie Van Halen, and then you had Jimmy Bates from Stormer, just a monster, you know, and there was a bunch of other ones, and all the bands were playing, like, either in backyards or, you know, they had huge parties or, you know, high schools, clubs in Hollywood, you know, there was just, uh, we were so... um, underdogs to be the ones to make it it, it was wasn't even funny really but once we met once we met that manager somehow all we had was a distribution deal because when he wanted to sign us his two business partners didn't and he goes well we you at least you know put it on the green world and and you know release it on that and we'll make our own label and they said that's fine you know, so so we really didn't have a proper record deal. We just had a distribution deal oh, wow. with Gre- with Green World. We we were on our own label, just made a made up name. But somehow, and I I've lived in L.A. my whole life, and I've never heard of this from anyone. Right. They wow. started playing on your knees on the biggest station in Los Angeles, was which was KMT. In heavy rotation, um, we're talking like Tom Petty, and then you hear Great White. It, it was—I had never heard of an unsigned band being played in rotation with big name bands in my in my lifetime. That's nice. When he when he first told us about it, we just thought it was an ad, like they were going to play an ad for a gig or something. Yeah. And then and then he goes because he brought a ghetto blaster and. We used to rehearse in a garage, so he put it on the front lawn, and and, and he knew right when they were going to play it. They played on your knees. We're going, holy God, we're on the radio. Just thinking it was a one-time only thing. Wow. And then come to find out, they're playing it like six times a day, and in heavy rotation. And because of that, all the major labels in town, um, you know were buzzing about us and we for two weeks we went to every label and just kind of chose the best one wow. what we thought was the best one and you no know, it, it was just a miracle you know if, if i've heard a lot of stories from all all kinds of bands and every story i hear is different yeah you know there's never some set deal where a band goes well we sent in our you know bio and you know, demo and our eight by 10 and they gave us a call and just signed us right then. You know, <laughs> it's never that it's like, never. Oh man, I was in the parking lot and you know, somebody stole my guitar and you know, yeah. luckily uh, I found it. And then there was this guy that knew a guy, you know, I mean, it's always a bizarre, right? you know, because really there's there, like I said, back in that era, there was so many great musicians that, it wasn't like I stood out and I was like an Eddie Van Halen or something. It just blew everybody away. You're good, though. You know, I was, I was a good guitar player, but um, I just think we assembled the right people and we were at the right place at the right time. It's like, you know, so I really believe your stars kind of have to line up a little bit, you know. But what we did was try to play more than everybody yeah. to kind of put, put ourselves in a good position to get lucky. Like, instead of just playing twice a month on the weekend, we tried to play, like, every night, you know, yeah. even if it was free. If they just point us to a stage and let us go play, and we don't care if we get paid or not. If we get paid, you know, maybe give us some free beer or something, yeah. you know, whatever. We didn't care. We wanted our name out there. That's all we cared about. Exposure. Because yeah. 
we wanted to treat ourselves like a Tide commercial. You know, it's like when you go to the store, you always get Tide because that's all you ever see. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and so we want we go. Maybe we can brainwash people into thinking they're supposed to like us. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so and uh, so that's what we the, that's what we did, and sure enough, it it happened. There was yeah. happened to be the, uh, the right guy in the crowd that could help us one night. You know. So there's a lot of luck, you know. Yeah. Um, I first heard of Great White uh, with the song Rock Me on MTV. And uh, I went ahead and bought that cassette back then. I must have played that cassette till the letters came off for sure. Uh, oh, thanks, man. That's oh, awesome. yeah. That one and the next one and the next couple. Now, and then uh, in the 90s, uh, we all know the story. The, the grunge stuff came in. And... Uh, a lot of bands, uh, you know, sales start going down. You know the story. Uh, did, yeah. did you guys go through a hard time emotionally? I mean, it would, were you guys uh, going through depression or, or how did you guys take that? Actually, believe it or not, I was kind of thrilled because I, I, I really felt that the end of the 80s, the music was really getting predictable. It was getting watered down. It's like the labels were just signing everybody that had long hair. And, I just felt like the music, like, I could almost tell you what the lyric was going to be in advance. It was getting so predictable. So when that band came along with their, you know, t-shirts and I don't care attitude and just plug in and go, I was like, yeah. God, thank God, <laughs> you know, if there's something like this, you know. Uh, yeah, it hurt us a little bit. We, we kept playing, you know, we were just playing mid-sized venues. We, we didn't play arenas at that time. Yeah. Um, until later in the 90s, you know, we do uh, big shed tours with the package. Like, we went out with Rat and Poison and I believe LA Guns. Yeah. And we played, uh, you know, amphitheaters and, and arenas. Nice. And, you know, that was like in 98 or 9. But uh, in those early 90s, you know, it was the grunge era. I, I, I thought, uh, you know, a couple of the bands were did it really good, like Alice in Chains. Uh, yeah. They had some nice melodies. Oh, yeah. It had a dark edge to it, but the, the songwriting was excellent. Oh, yeah. So it, it didn't bother me. And uh, we kept going on. We've always had a loyal fan base. So, you sure. know, and we were still playing big festivals in, in Europe. For some reason, in Japan and Europe, Nothing can swim by and say that, you know, like rock is dead. It, it doesn't matter. It can be Nirvana. It doesn't matter what go. They're so loyal to like the Scorpions, Judas Priest, you know. Right, I've seen that, yeah. Uh, all, all those type bands, you know, even us, uh, they, they don't just drop you and move to some other thing. Got it, they, yeah. they they might they might go oh this Nirvana shit's cool I'm gonna buy it you know I, I really think it's great yeah. but they won't leave you get me so so that's one thing about Europe um, that you know Iron Maiden can still go out and play for three hundred thousand people even though Nirvana is a monster you yeah. know it, it, it's uh, the fan base yeah. so I always like that 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 loyalty in Japan's the same way. You know, oh, really? they might dig dig the hell out of uh, Nirvana, but it didn't. You know, the Scorpions could still go play Budokan three nights. You know, so um, but the '90s was kind of down in, in the U.S. for uh, as far as the arena tours. And what always struck me about about the '90s is they would go out and play arenas with seven bands. You know, we used to go out with one headliner and and. We would just open for, you know, White Snake, the Scorpions, Alice Cooper. It'd be maybe an opening act, but we never brought out this like, you know, seven bands to play in arena. Yeah. Uh, you know, just be like we played just us and Judas Priest, and we sold out arenas every night. Oh. Uh, you know, and it, I couldn't understand it because Alice and Chain sold millions, and and you know, Nirvana sold millions. Yep. Yeah. But, but they always had this giant package of bands to fill an arena. I don't get it. It's like, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't have an answer for that. You know, is it because 
the fans don't go to their show. I mean, you know, I don't even know. Different, yeah, <laughs> different, different fans, yeah. Yeah, they're different type fans. Oh, wow. But uh, it was, uh, but, you know, it, instead of getting all negative about Nirvana going, oh, they ruined us, I, yeah. I was like, I, I was relieved uh, that they were going to kind of end the watered down version of the 80s. Because in the beginning, it was just a handful of bands, you know, you had, you know, Bon Jovi, Rat, yeah. you know, um, Quiet Riot, you know, uh, Stockin'. It, it, there wasn't like, 50 bands yeah. you know and um, and what happened after a while you couldn't tell if it was Dawkin or you know some band that just sounds just like them or, you know <laughs> it, it just became that's what I mean about watered down it was same 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 and, and everybody looked the same I think that's why they call it hair metal or whatever right you know cause, as I told the journalist more than once that my hair has never written a song you know <laughs> uh, if you're talking about the fashion, I totally get it. Just yeah. like they had beads and long hair and headbands and bell bottoms in the '70s, you know. Yeah. Uh, but are you going to call that bell bottom music? I mean, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good you know, one because <laughs> it was so diverse. I mean, you, if you compare Crosby, Stills, and Nash to Hendrix, I mean, yeah. you know, you, you can't just categorize that all in one one ter terminology. You know. Well, uh, good point right there. Um, now, Mitch Malloy, congrats on finding uh, and hiring Mitch Malloy. Yeah. He's, he's doing a great job with you guys. He's awesome, charismatic, yeah. you know, great voice. Uh, but for the people yeah. that don't know uh, the story, what happened with Jack Russell? And what what happened there? What, why did he leave or was he fired? Or No, no, he wasn't fired. Um, you know, in the almost 30 years that we worked together, I think I can... It, we might have gotten like two arguments, wow. <laughs> you know, seriously. Really? I mean, we were blood brothers. What what happened was, is, um, you know, his demons just overcame him. Oh, wow. And he, we were out on tour and he was falling down, breaking bones. He had to, um, I read about that. you know, yeah. Yeah. he was very um, sick, you know, yeah. with uh, his addiction. Yeah. And. I, I work with addicts, like, daily. I mean, I literally have worked one-on-one -on -one with over 100 people in the last nine years. And there are some, there are people I've met that can get a DUI, and, and they got nine years sobriety today, you know? Yeah. It's like a DUI is plenty. And then there's, a there's on the other part of the scale, there's a guy that loses his family, his, you know, his job, his house, his cars, and everything, and he still doesn't stop, you know? Wow. And we tried everything, and, and Jack was just unable to perform. Wow. And he was so sick, his body was just breaking down. He had a walker, you know, we had to push him in the airports in a wheelchair. He had to sit down at the shows. And so it became so bad, and he was so dope sick that he just could not continue. And so we just told them, bro, you know, and I've been at his hospital bed. I've been at his bedside in rehab centers day after day after day, being as supportive as possible. And, um, yeah. you know, we just said, go get well. You know, we'll get a singer to fill in and, yeah. and just get yourself healthy. Yeah. And, and he kind of just was unable to return. He just, uh, oh. he didn't want to want to you know come back on those terms so he just went out and found found musicians that would play with them yeah and just kind of was going to make his own great white which kind of turned into this like lawsuit thing which we hated mm -hmm. but um because uh you know people that assemble together they're called the band because it's a group of people yeah you know so one guy can't just leave and just call himself the band, you know. Yeah, no, that, that was our point. So we kind of won the lawsuit, but we wanted him to have a way to make a living because, um, you know, the people he worked with were accepting him the way he was. So we were fine with that. And uh, so we let him call himself Jack Russell's Great White or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate because you know, the whole situation that had to happen because he was, you know, 
not treating himself well. Yeah. But I never have ever taken it personal, someone's addictions. It, it, they're not doing it to hurt me. Uh, uh, Jack didn't do what he did to hurt me. Yeah. He, he just, some, just have a difficult time that, that the addiction is so damn powerful. Yeah. And you really, to get away from that, you just have to surrender, just drop to your knees and beg God. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard thing, yeah. I, it's it's very difficult. So that's what happened with that. You know, people, uh, you know, I think fans are a little confused. They, they uh, go, why don't you patch things up? And I go, like, we've never even gotten a fight before. Well, there's nothing to patch up. Oh, wow. He's just, um, you know, he's unhealthy and... Uh, yeah, I read some stories. It's yeah. just that, you know, and we're at the age now where, you know, you really don't want to have all this drama and, you know, I don't know if you've ever, you know, been around somebody that's, you know, really high and you're not. Yeah, I got, a bunch, like, of, I got a bunch of friends, it's yeah. Like, yeah. It's like you're in two different worlds, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because we're, we're all sober and focused and everything, and, if, you know, it's it's kind of like having a liability around. I mean, if if you worked at a at a job, and you know there's people counting on you, and you got one guy that just doesn't have it together, it just makes everything kind of crumble. And so that's all it was. It was like we just said, "Go get well." Well, that's it. Well, oh. come back healthy, and let's kick some ass. You know, oh, and well. he was just not not able to do that. So. We, we have all the love for him, and I wish, I always wish him the, you know, the best of everything. And I, I never have any ill will toward yeah. him or, or his addiction. No. Nothing. I read, I'm, you know. I read an interview where, where Jack uh, says he went to see you guys live in a, in a Houston venue sometime a couple of years ago or last year. Uh, mm -hmm. He spoke very well of you guys, man, and, and you guys sound badass. Yeah. I mean, Mitch does a great job, and... You guys are yeah. still great white. It's the same guys, you know, basically. Yeah. Um, Jack is, Jack is, a, he's a, he's a good dude, you know. Uh, like I said, that's really unfortunate, you know. We, we were brothers, teams to the end, the whole deal. It's just, um, and we wanted to be teams to the end. It's just, uh, yeah. the, the addiction, the unfortunate addiction just didn't allow that to happen. But the, I think the love is still there. And he's still making music, so God bless him. Have you talked to Jack since or any time? I haven't. I haven't talked to him. Oh, wow. Well. You know, that's kind of weird, too. But, you know, it's just, it's it's nothing personal. Again, yeah. you know, I have so many friends that I haven't spoken to in, like, 20 years. I mean, it yep. some, something happens when you pass a certain age, and yeah. everybody kind of disappears, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> it's, just, it's just nothing, you know, you're, you're living in your own world, and, you know, I'm making music, I'm going back and forth up north, laying stuff on tape, I'm, you know, I'm really busy, I'm, you know, right. I got this lockdown thing going on, you know, so... So we're making a lot of music. We're trying to take advantage of this, uh, you know, pandemic or pandemic. Whatever. Yeah. So I usually so, uh, I'll usually ask the artists uh, I'm interviewing to pick their give me their best and worst gigs. Now, obviously, I'm not going to ask for your worst gig. We all know we yeah. we're aware of that. So let's not talk about that. Uh, can you give us your best gig? Best gig? Uh, ah. <laughs> hmm. Too many of those. I I'll say. You know, one of my favorite gigs that we ever did because it was a, 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 you know, our dream to play there was the night we played the Forum. Um, it, because you know, it, it's it's a legendary place. You know, Zeppelin played there, so many bands, and it's where the Lakers play. Yep. And my parents were there, and you know, guys I went to school with in seventh grade were in the front rows. And the record company gave us the platinum records that night, so I, I'd have to rate that real high. There, there was one other show we did, believe it or not, and I really thought it was a cool show, and I think you can even watch some of it on YouTube. It really? was uh, years ago. We played a place in New York called The Ritz. Okay, yeah. We actually, our manager managed Guns N' Roses at the time, so oh. we did the show with them for the MTVs. And, um, 
even though I was real sick, uh, that show went off really well. I had like a hundred and three degree temperature. Wow! So of course, so of course, I just drank six Heinekens and I was fine. But uh, <laughs> you know, like I said back then, I just cured everything with, with beer. <laughs> right. But uh, but that was a nice show. For musicians, uh, give us a quick a quick rig uh, rundown. What's Mark Kendall using nowadays? So what are you using and abusing? Uh, believe it or not, um, and I only learned about this in 2017 from Michael Wagner when we did our last record. Um, I've been using the Kemper, okay. and I've been live. And, yes. you know, I still have all my stacks. I still got speakers blasting, you know, but... Um, I'm able to use several different amps that are like really real profiles of the amps that when you A and B them, you literally can't, the human ear can't detect the difference. So that way I can, on every given song I play, I can have the exact sound I had on the record. And, and it's so consistent no matter what the building sounds like because the guy in the house doing the sound gets a direct feed from each of my sound plus the mic on my amp. Nice. So, so sound men love it because it's so direct. You just get guitar right in your face and it, it's consistent. You don't have to worry about like how the room sounds that night or whatever. It, it just, it's very consistent for live. In the studio, I still use different things, you know, Marshalls, you know, um, you know, I use a, a, an old Fender basement head that I have that sounds insane. Nice. Uh, so, uh, because it's that saturated tube sound, yeah. like if you find one that's below 1963, it's called the pre-CBS Fender basement head. Oh, wow. You turn up the volume; it doesn't get too loud before the before the tubes create distortion, and it's that that true, yeah, you know, ZZ Top, Trace Ombre's type, yeah. you know, true tube sound. It's not a, a, a distortion that's created from a pedal. I can hear it. It's yeah. created because the volume pushes the tubes, but it's super clean. Like the notes are loud. Plus, you got the your badass tone uh, and that's the way that fender is i've never taken it on the road i'm too afraid to yeah but i i profiled it oh well so i i have it you know but i don't have to carry it around in airplanes and have a heart attack but um nice you know and there's a lot of great tube guys you know uh, for all you up-and-comers you know that aren't technical you can talk to a lot of different tube guys like terry kilgore He's a guitar player. He played with Dave Lee Roth, kind of known local guitar player, but he's a master of the tube, tube placement and heads. He can change out one tube in your power line, like just put a Sylvania in there or some some tube that's kind of hard to find, and it it makes your sound completely do something different. Oh wow! So um, it, it's really fun to mix and match tubes with a guy that knows what he's doing. I, I'm not suggesting that um, you know some guitar player go out and start messing with tubes in there. <laughs> you know, that doesn't that doesn't know what he's doing. You know, make sure that the guy that's what he does. You know, like Eddie Van Halen had a tube guy, Jose. You know, he knows how to mod the heads. You yeah. know, there's a lot of guys that do mods on heads. And those are probably the guys you want to talk to that know how to find those old TV tubes that are really hard to get. Yeah. There's several different variations. Um, I remember in the 5150 heads, because I couldn't get it to sound good, I, I wanted to try it, give it a shot. It wasn't for me. It sounded yeah. too mid rangey. Great for Eddie. Oh, yeah. Um, but his uh, guitar tech, I, I was at, uh, I think it was the forum during the day during their sound check and he said all they're exactly what people buys but he just pulls one tube out so it goes from 100 watts to 75 he oh. doesn't do anything else except pull a tube out in the power line so i found that interesting okay um but there's little things you can do but uh, you know just like with any guitar player it's mostly in your hands that's where the sound comes from there you go because I've played through 
every kind of amp. I mean, um, Glenn used his album. I didn't even bring an amp, and they had a, like an Ampeg combo amp. I plugged into that, did my parts in 20 minutes, and it sounded like everything else I've ever done. <laughs> you know, so there was no magic amp that's going to make it sound like me. Right. It, it just, you know. So there's a lot to say about that. It does come from your hands, but you know, a good, nice tube sound. I mean, of course, there's going to be some some difference between that and like a solid state type fuzzy, yeah. you know, type sound. But uh, so, what's next for for Mark and uh, the band? What can fans expect next? Um, you know, we're hoping to start playing shows. Um, I think there's something in April, and then uh, we're going over to some island. They're doing that instead of the monster cruise. Um, you know, hopefully things tone down we're, we're, with, with the uh, with the uh, virus. You know, with all the they got the vaccines now, and I heard the therapeutics are doing pretty good. So oh. hopefully. Uh, you know the fear factor and stuff like that starts to you know because people are they're ready to rock i mean i just know it you know? sure we all are what i read sure. on social media i mean oh, they yeah. really want we've done a, a few you know like the social distancing type shows and and whatnot but we got to get back to normal one and start rocking again you know yeah. people are ready for it it's looking good out there so hopefully soon we'll see you guys on the road uh would you like to send a message to your fans listening to yeah. this podcast? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, just want to say, uh, you know, the loyalty of our fans. And we are so appreciative and grateful for all of you. Um, you know, there's nothing I love more. One thing about this band is we never leave anywhere until everything is signed and all pictures are taken. We never... Uh, you know, run out of buildings like the Beatles or something, just trying to get away. Yeah. Of course, nobody's trying to hurt us, but, <laughs> but uh, or, or you know, tackle us or anything. But it, so um, we do that because we're so appreciative, and there's nothing I love more than to hear your stories and like you know, because I've heard so many you know, people saying, "Oh, I was in high school when this song came out," or "I got my first girlfriend," or "I." got married to that song we are so grateful we don't take that for granted we're 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 totally 100 percent grateful for the loyalty you've shown us thanks so much we're going to continue to make the best music we can and hopefully you dig it awesome thank you mark thank you for spending time with us and uh we hope to see you on the road too man thanks james appreciate it man what a legend what an interview such a down-to-earth person man if if nobody would have told me if i was an outsider a non-rock fan and i would have heard this interview and this this man talking mark kendall i would have known for sure i would have said this is not a musician this is just a very nice person a down-to-earth person man so uh that must be quite a feat man something difficult to have toured the world forever over 30 years of tours with great white and still remained remain very grounded and very down to earth as mr kendall is so big shout out and thank you to mr kendall and all the great white uh camp so uh, on behalf of myself james thank you for your support to all the listeners and all around the world in every country that you might be in uh keep safe and let's get through this pandemic keep rocking and don't forget to keep it metal That metal interview.